Hello everyone, welcome to our workshop, Engaging Resources for Teaching. My name is Ekaterina Stoops and I am the e-learning faculty development coordinator. And we have two presenters today, uh, Mary Mara and Carolyn Begin. Carolyn, do I pronounce your name correctly, last minute name? Okay. Uh, and they will be talking about engaging resources for teaching. So before we begin our webinar, I would like to go over some house rules. To participate in interactive activities that Carolyn and Mary prepared for you, you can use the chat and type your questions and comments in chat, or you can use your microphones and speak. But then when, when you're not speaking, please keep your mics muted so that we're not getting any background noise. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the webinar, please let us know um, via chat and we'll help you out. We have several moderators in the room. If you lose connectivity and collaborate, you can always email us at bbsupport at cdu.edu and we'll help you get back and collaborate. And now I would like to introduce our presenters. Mary Mara is the director of the City U, uh, City U's, uh, Seattle Library, <laughs> my goodness, City University of Seattle Library and Learning Resource Center. And she, yeah, it's a mouthful. She manages the library team who are responsible for curating digital resources and course integrated instruction. Mary has many years of experience in design and delivery of online instruction content and courses. And our second presenter, Carolyn. Carolyn is the direct is the associate director of instruction for City University of Seattle Library and Resource and Learning Resource Center. She is responsible for the development of City Youth Integrated Information Literacy Instruction Program and manages instruction and, re and reference library team. Caroline also serves as a liaison for the, uh, for the School of Applied Leadership and Programs in Canada. She is the member of City Youth Academic Assessment Committee and Faculty Standards Development Committee. And without further ado, Mary and Caroline, please take it away. Okay, and I'm going to share my uh, video for just a little bit here on the first couple of slides. So welcome today to the webinar on engaging resources for teaching, where to find them and how to use them. Today's webinar is essentially in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about quality resources you can use to find new strategies to engage students. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about fair use guidelines. And finally, Carolyn is going to um, share with you some ways to locate engaging content in the City U Library collection. And for bandwidth reasons now, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video sharing, but it's good to have you, uh, Leela and Mark, online with us. Happy to be here. <laughs> Great. So the first, um, we're going to be moving pretty quickly through the webinar. So the first thing I want to let you know is that um, you will get slides uh, with our presentation that include links to the resources. And you'll be able to explore them after the presentation on your own time. Uh, before we begin, we wanted to learn a little bit about you. Mark, We I know you, but uh, we have, do have two questions we'd like you and Leela to respond to. And the first one is, how many years of experience do you have teaching? I love those, calling a horse. And then, um, Leela, I'm wondering if you want to... Um, Mute your microphone, maybe. We're getting some background noise. Um, so, Mark, you have more than three years of experience. And, uh, Leela, I don't know if you have a chance to... Um, you, she did. Okay. There we go. Okay. Great. Um, and then my second question is, what is the primary delivery mode that you teach in? Okay. I've taught for about six years at City University of Seattle. Mm -hmm. My primary delivery mode, mode is in class. Okay. Well, the good news is, and Lee was primarily online, um, so uh, the good thing is that 
uh, we have resources for you, whether you are teaching online, uh, mixed mode or in person, and whether you are just starting out or you have many years of teaching experience. So at CityU, all instructors are required to use Blackboard as part of their teaching, regardless of whether they teach in person, mixed mode, or fully online. There's several sources for information on how best to use Blackboard's features to engage students. These include Blackboard's exemplary course program. This program offers a peer-reviewed process for course design and delivery, and each year awards are given to high-scoring courses. While you likely won't submit your course for peer review, the program is a great source for ideas on effective teaching strategies for online or mixed-mode courses. You can also use the exemplary course rubric as a self-assessment tool for your course, um, and that can be very beneficial. In addition to the exemplary course program, Blackboard maintains a blog, and sometimes they post articles about effective teaching strategies. The article pictured here, Delivering Great Online Courses Through Effective Teaching Strategies, is just one example of what you might find there. If you want to view tutorials that are more specific to CityU, the e-learning team has a rich repository of material available through the CityU Help Center on the Faculty tab. And you can access that on the faculty portal at my.cityu.edu. And then last but not least, CityU has nearly finished developing its own rubric for exemplary course design and delivery. So watch for an announcement from the e-learning team when this is finalized. Within CDU, another excellent source for information on developing and delivering your courses can be found on the Faculty Development SharePoint site. You can access this by navigating to home.cityu.edu and selecting Faculty Development from the Staff and Faculty Services menu. In addition to manuals, guidelines, and best practices here, you can access previous CSI webinar recordings on a range of topics through the CDU uh, Faculty Development blog. I just want to point out that the class delivery manual for instructors has recently undergone a major update and revision with input from program directors and course managers. This manual describes the standards for class delivery at CityU and may have some ideas for you on um, how to engage your students. Also, the key best practices from CityU faculty represents a summary of research completed at CityU by Dr. Kelly Flores currently the Dean of the Schools of Leadership, Education, and Arts and Sciences, and Dr. Kurt Kirstein, CityU's Provost. It's a great source for information. Mary. Yeah, that, Mike. That last one, where can I, I didn't write all that stuff down. Am I going to be able to go into, go online and dig into those? Absolutely. Um, there are links embedded in the slide that you can go back to. Um, let me just show that to you really quickly here at the bottom of the slide, home.cityu.edu. So you'll be able to click on that to navigate back there, Mark, after the presentation is over when you get the slide okay. deck. Okay. So beyond the resources available through Blackboard or CityU, there are, of course, a wealth of resources that can be found online. I like to go to other centers for teaching and learning just to see what other universities are talking about. Um, I've included two here. One is uh, from Vanderbilt University, and I like this one because the teaching practices are um, embedded in learning theory. And um, so it's a nice, wealth, uh, rich sort of view of, of the teaching strategy to engage students. Cornell University's Teaching Ideas a repository provides information from the initial process of identifying learning outcomes through engaging students, assessing their work, teaching with technology, and a lot more. And finally, um, the Iowa State Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching is a YouTube channel with 99 videos posted at the time of this webinar. Some of these will be of interest to CityU instructors, including one called Setting the Stage for Universal Design. There are also open source uh, resources that have great ideas for engaging students. Merlot 2 is one of the largest repositories, and you'll find resources for teaching, such as the Universal Design for Learning case studies and resources I've 
uh, focused on here. But you'll also uh, possibly find resources suitable for use by the students in your course. Primo is a database that focuses specifically on resources teaching students how to find, evaluate, and use information ethically. If you notice your students struggling with an aspect of the research process, you might find an activity to adopt here. Or, of course, you're encouraged to contact the library and assign to your course for help designing and delivering a targeted lesson to your students. You can locate the contact information for your librarian under faculty information in your Blackboard shell, whether you're teaching in person, mixed mode, or online. I've also included uh, the CityU Libraries How-To Guides. These are on-demand tutorials that teach students or faculty the skills they need to locate information for use in CityU courses. Can we go back Sorry, just a minute? Jumped ahead. There we go. Okay, another source of ideas for changing up your teaching are journals on teaching and learning. This list represents a sampling of some of the key journals, um, and they run the range from highly academic to more practical and applied. Most of the relevant journals you would find in EBSCO's Education Source or in ProQuest's Education Journal Database. Uh, examples of articles you might find include one from Adult Learning called Increasing Writing Self-Efficacy of Adult Learners, and another from College Teaching called Student Responsible Learning, Getting Students to Read Online Discussions. I particularly like College Teaching for the practical um, recommendations that are published. Hi, Craig. Thanks for joining us. Um, and last but not least, CityU has over 230,000 ebooks in its collection. These cover a range of topics, including resources for instructors on how to effectively engage students. Between 2011 and 2016, City University of Seattle published five volumes in the Proven Practices in Higher Education series. Each book includes chapters written by CityU instructors that highlight research-based practices for teaching. The ebooks are now accessible through the CityU Library Catalog through CityU's Academic Repository or through the nationally known ERIC database. I've also included on this slide two ebooks from experts in the field of online instruction, Rena Payloff and Keith Pratt. Um, <clears throat> those are great resources if you're teaching online or in mixed mode. And Rena Payloff also has YouTube videos of presentations at conferences that are worth watching. So now we're going to shift over to fair use guidelines. So the provost and program directors at CityU strongly recommend encourage, um, instructors to add content to their courses in order to engage students and enhance their learning. Given, Mary, this, given this, yeah. This Mark? Is Mark, I have a question. Is sure. It, it's they want instructors to do things to enhance the learning of the students. So one of the things that I think that is really critical are case studies. Yes. And because students, the ones that when I taught, come from countries where it just seems like they memorize what their, the text says or what what's given by the instructor, and they spit it back in the finals. But Resolving problems is, is something they struggle with. Right. Uh, so for those students, they're sometimes not in a work setting that aligns with the degree that they are, um, are trying to earn their younger age. And so having case studies that show them um, or have them wrestle with a situation that they would normally encounter in a work setting is a really good way to engage them, Mark. Because case studies it, can be difficult to find, and I think you know that. <laughs> I think we've some of my library team has, has helped you, um, and some of the best ones from Harvard Business Review you have to purchase in order to use them with students. I did that, and I had I had about six case studies I wanted, and it didn't cost me very much to purchase the initial one. But then when I went back and says now I want to distribute it to my students, wow, cost would would yeah. way up. Yeah, well, you'll see in these fair use guidelines, we've got a question for you, a scenario for you about Harvard Business Review, and you might know how to answer that one, Mark. Okay. So um, 
you know, given that it's really nice to add resources to your course, it's also really important for you to add them in a way that complies with fair use guidelines. And uh, fair use guidelines are complicated. Um, sometimes they are interpreted to mean that any information found can be shared with students in any format for as long as is needed, but this is not really accurate. And if that were challenged in court, it would likely result in findings against CityU or against an instructor. Um, the primary components to fair use are listed on this slide. However, instructors really should read CityU's copyright policy and the instructional use of copyrighted materials for a more detailed view of what is or is not allowed. In general, it is within fair use to share a current resource with students that's related to the topic of the course if the resource is, sh is shared with one group of students in one section of the course for one term in which the course is offered. If the resource is required and is used quarter after quarter, most likely copyright fees should be paid for use of the resources. So now we have three common scenarios to share with you, and we're going to ask you to let us know if you believe they fall inside or outside of fair use guidelines. As a reminder, the votes you cast are confidential and will not be individually identifiable. So please don't hesitate to make your best guess. These are a little bit tricky. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead to the second one. So in the first scenario, you are teaching Counseling 522, Systemic Theory, Crisis, Disaster, and Trauma. You want to recommend a current article to your students in the announcement introducing this week's topic. You search the library's psychology collections database and locate the following article available in PDF or HTML formats. You download the PDF from the database and attach it to your announcement for easy access by students. So uh, Whitney's going to share a poll. Uh, is this within fair use or outside of fair use? It's the library's psychology collection. It is the library's psychology collection. So I'm just going to wait one more minute. Um, so like I said, this is tricky. This actually is not considered fair use. The vendor licensing that we have for our database is explicitly calls out that if an article from their database is going to be used as a class reading that's required, it needs to be provided to the students as a persistent link. And the reason for that is that what kind the, of a link? Uh, it's called a persistent link, Mark. Um, we have a tutorial on our website on how to develop, the, on how to find those that I would be happy to send to everybody who's in the webinar today when it's over. Oh, Carolyn is going to share it with you actually in her part of the presentation. So um, the reason that they want you to link to the article instead of using a PDF is so that they can track how many times that article is viewed. And that information is ultimately sent to the journal in which the, publish, in which the article is published and factors into royalty fees that are paid to the author. So we're going to go ahead and move on. In the second scenario, you're teaching EAD 505, Research and Adult Learning Theory. You locate an article you want to share with your students. The article, Context-Based Adult Learning from the journal New Directions for Adult and Continuing Education, is available in PDF format on a faculty member's website at Andrews University. You create a link to the article in your announcement, directing students to the faculty member's website to read the article. Okay, and one person got that right. This is not fair use, and this uh, case is pretty tricky. Um, how would you be able to know this? Well, this actually happened in my class, and what um, happened for me is I recognized the publisher of the journal, and I thought it was highly unlikely that they would provide an open access uh, link to one of their articles. I looked at the URL and could see it wasn't from the publisher's website, but was from Andrews University. 
and I found, um, I did find that the article was available through one of our databases, so whenever possible, it's preferred to link to an item through our databases instead of um, online. Uh, no, as I mentioned, this kind of issue is really tricky, and so if you have any question whatsoever, reach out to your uh, course librarian and ask them to uh, take a look at the resources you're thinking about including in your course. That's agreed. That ought to be a number three. Check with the library. Check with the library. There you go, Mark. I'll have, <laughs> add that the next time I do this. Um, and then the last scenario. For this one, you're teaching MBA 545, People and Systems in Organizations. You want your students to read a recent cover story from Harvard Business View, Review. What sets successful CEOs apart? You find that the article is available in CityU's Business Source Complete Database and tell your students this is required reading for the week's activities. Okay. Um, and again, I said I've got tricky scenarios here. So this actually is not fair use. Um, Mark, you had an experience with this. Harvard Publishing is particularly restrictive in the use of its resources for teaching because they know they can be. Business Source Complete is the only database through which you can access the Harvard Business Review Journal. And while persistent links are available to some articles, and some of the articles allow individuals to download or email PDF files, others require reading online when logged into the database. In addition to that, each article includes a statement at the bottom saying that content on EBSCO hosts is licensed for the private individual use of authorized EBSCO host users. It is not intended for use as assigned course material in academic institutions. So just like the case study mark that you purchased and then had to purchase copies for your students, any specific article that you want to require students to read from Harvard Business Review needs to be purchased by those individual students, even though City is already paying for access through Business Source Complete. Now we think some of the things that you could do is you could ask your students to read an article from Harvard Business Review on a particular topic and let them pick any article from that journal um, because then it's more of an individual selection. Um, and there's nothing that stops us or stops a student from accessing a required article um, in Harvard Business Review that's listed in their course uh, if they realize that they can get it through Business Source Complete. We just can't require that they read it and give them a link to Business Source Complete. Well, and Mary, now we're going to turn. Yes, the last, last times I taught, we had, there's a uh, a case study about the Boeing's, uh, what's the name of the plane? I forgot the, the latest one where they didn't, get, uh, the, the, they had to buy their parts from about businesses in 10 different countries. So, so anyway, uh, and that was an article we talked, and we had the guy, the, the director of manufacturing for that, it's the Boeing's Dreamliner airplane, yeah. the new one spot. He actually came down and talked about it and then he had he had, he actually gave us the the uh, case study and I called him and said I'd like to hand it out to each of the students in a subsequent class and have mm -hmm. them work. He checked with the associated uh, author of it and got permission that we could do it so we used it that way. I guess. Is that right, okay? Yeah, you have uh, permission from the authors of the case study, then I yeah. think it's fine. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And so now I'm going to go ahead and turn uh, the presentation over to Carolyn for the last part. All right, so Mary went over a lot of really good resources that you could use, so I'm going to go over how to navigate the library website and how to potentially find some of those in addition to some tips and tricks to um, adding resources that are a little bit out of the ordinary, like videos. So, um, all right, so you'll always want to start on the library website. We have a large variety of materials there. Um, you can get to the library website from your Blackboard shell. Um, there's a link on the right-hand side. 
You can also get to it from the faculty portal, which is the my.cdu.edu. It's under the campus links right below your email. So those are two really easy ways to get there, or you can just bookmark library.cdu.edu. So some examples of things that you can find there are academic articles, newspapers, magazines, ebooks, videos, and some cases, and um, we can go over some of that in a little bit. And then I'll also, so I'm going to be sharing my screen and going out to the library website to demonstrate this, but we can also go through how to find a known item or journal. Um, so I'll go through Harvard Business Review as an example, and Mary also had a lot of really good journal title examples, and so I'll show you how to do that if you want to find those particular journals. So I'm going to share my screen. <coughs> All right, so everyone should see the library website. Um, so you can do some searches here on in the um, first search bar there. You can type in keywords, titles, all kinds of things. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of different collections, and those are under the databases. So if you go to databases A to Z, you'll see the long list of databases that we have. They're in alphabetical order, and they all have a little description of what is in there and the topic that it covers. So there's quite a few, and then they're organized by subject as well. So um, for Mark, you'd probably want to click on this business and leadership. Uh, we have a psychology instructor. You could um, click on counseling and psychology. And so that's how you would sort through there. And then if you have a particular journal in mind, we can also uh, find it by name or by um, topic. So if you go to this Find Journals button, it, which is in the middle, you will get a search screen. And you can type in the name, or you can browse by title or browse by subject. So I'm going to do Harvard since we've talked about how tricky it is. You type in the name and then you will get some information about it and where it is found. So it will tell you which database it's in, which is in Business Source Complete. And then another important thing to note is the date that we have available. Some journals have embargoes, which um, means that they limit the access to some other newer articles. Sometimes we won't have the latest year or the latest issue. It kind of depends on the journal, but this is a really good place to get that kind of information. So if you know the title or the topic you want to cover, you can search there, or you can go into the database and look by date and by volume and issue. And that's usually a really reliable way to find something when you have all that information. So let's say we know it's from 2014 and we know it's issue 92.9. If you click on that, it will open all of the different articles that were in that issue that are available for you to read. Um, if you click on the PDX full text, it will open, or you can search over here if you know what is in um, that journal that you're looking for. All right, so I'm going to go back to my slides. So I'm going to go over some tips and tricks to adding um, mostly videos, um, the articles we talked about persistent links a little bit, and I'll show you how to do that as well. So um, one of the things that Mark mentioned was cases, and they are uh, particularly hard to find because usually they cost money. So editing videos into shorter clips can be a way to get those cases or those examples that you want to show students. Um, you can you know, edit a little piece and have students come up with a solution. That's also really popular in the psychology classes. You can have um, someone describe a problem and then have students talk about it. You can do that for practice sessions, discussion boards, um, conversations in class, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's also a really good idea to embed the videos directly into Blackboard. And we're always happy to help with that, but um, Blackboard support always also has um, help on, on doing that as well. And so use the variety of resources that we have and embed them into your class to engage students. Um, they say that students have a short attention span when it comes to videos, so three to five minutes. So that's also a good practice when you're making these shorter videos. So how do you do that? Um, so the videos are in the database collections that I went over. We have a large collection. We have Sage Research Methods, which goes over those methods. Alexander Street Press, um, Canopy. Canopy is another one that has a lot of psychology videos and a lot of feature films that you could edit. We have Criminal Justice, Education. 
uh, business, all kinds of topics to cover. So it's uh, a best practice in the, those video collections to create playlists. You can share the entire playlist with your students so that they could see videos that you recommend. And then that is also how you create those shorter clips. Um, so I'm going through this pretty quickly, but if you want to do this and you're not sure how, just um, contact the library and we can guide you through that. So from your playlist, you can edit the videos and then um, you can add a title and the description is a really good place to talk to your students about what you want them to focus on when watching that video. And then as you're watching, you can just hit these start and stop buttons to create your clips. Can I create my own video for the class? You can, yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, we have some software to do that. You can use Collaborate Ultra like this. You can record sessions. You can record yourself. Um, there's, there's a large number of different kind of software that you can use, and, and there's lots of support here at CityU for that. We have the recording rooms as well where you can come in and people can help you do that. And then you can upload them to um, Kaltura, which is in the Blackboard shell. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways to do that. Yeah, and that's a really good way to engage your students as well, and then they get to know you a little bit for those on online courses. They laugh at you when they mm -hmm. see you. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't laugh. <laughs> All right, so um, so no one likes broken links. Um, when you're adding stuff in classes, um, you know the links often change, and that's why we mention those persistent links. Um, so here are a couple of tips and tricks. So from the library homepage, we have a how-to guide, which is the tab at the top. If you go under research and create a persistent link, we have a list of all of the different databases that we offer and how to find that persistent link. Um, so that eliminates some of that frustration from the students when they try to open something and it doesn't work. Um, it also gives them you know, some information about where it is, they might discover, you know, by going into the database, they might discover something else. So it's always a good idea to use those persistent links. And then give them as much information as you can about the resource, and hopefully um, we can guide you in doing that APA format. If we expect APA from them, it's nice for us to provide it when we have resources in the show. So add titles, authors, um, any of the information that you have, that also helps with the link problem. So if you have a link in there that breaks, um, if the librarians and the instructor have a little bit more information about that, we can resolve that problem a lot faster by trying to find that resource somewhere else. Another nice thing to do when you're adding videos, images, documents, is to add captioning. And a lot of the, a lot of the software will do that for you. Um, and Canopy and all our video databases also have that option to provide transcripts and captions. Um, and adding text to videos and images also helps with um, screen readers. So if anyone's using one of those, that's really helpful for them. And then if you provide a video, it's nice to also have like a, a transcript or um, a kind of a Word document that explains what's going on in that video. All right, and that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Well, I, you know, we, I used to make a lot of videos. In fact, I, I've forgotten. I must have made 40 videos, maybe not quite that many. But then all of a sudden, they weren't, weren't, I couldn't keep them in the system any longer, and so they're offloaded to YouTube. Which, and I can use those, because my videos were uh, Excel spreadsheets. Uh, showing a calculation and how to go about doing doing it, but, and 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 leaving it for them to uh, understand or re, uh, redo it at home. Uh, yeah, that's a great use of that technology, Mark. And we did have a period of time. I know that um, the video repository that was being used for that kind of content at CityU, that there was a need to migrate it as part of the Blackboard migration, I want to say. And so I'm glad that you were able to get your videos moved over to YouTube and that you can still use them. Yep. They're still there. Yeah. And now um, we have Cultura, which is integrated into 
uh, the Blackboard environment. Okay. So I can so I can I can go back in and make some more videos then. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to that. Are there any other questions? We moved really quickly through a whole lot of material. Yes, you have. My question is, can I go back in some place and look at this and go through more le uh, leisurely and, and then I'll have questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ekaterina is going to talk to you about uh, where the slides will be available to you. Okay. That's and good. If any of the, um, uh, you're welcome, Leela. If any of the links in the slides end up breaking, because that does sometimes happen, um, you can just reach out to us and we will help you locate those resources. Okay. I'm just putting my uh, email in the chat if you want to okay. take a look at that. Yeah. Okay, Mary and Carolyn, thank you very much for um, really useful presentation. Uh, Mark, to address your question about the video recording, yes, I will. Um, added this, this recording and I will post it on our faculty development blog um, and Whitney just provided the link to the blog. All CSI webinars are recorded and I post the recordings on this blog so you can watch this recording or any other recording um, that we um, recording of the webinars that we had this year. Uh, so just a couple of very quick announcements. Um, I will be sending out uh, a very short evaluation form tomorrow. This form is anonymous and has just a few questions. If you could respond to the questions and leave your comments, we would greatly appreciate it. And also, uh, we will continue with this uh, webinars next year and I am looking for new presenters. If you have an idea uh, topic that you would like to present on, um, just email me directly and we will chat. I uh, wouldn't if you could type my email address. Um, so, and that is all for today. Uh, again, this recording will be posted just in a few days. And thank you very much for attending this webinar, for participating, for questions and comments, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.